August the 16th, 2037. Sunday, August 16th, 2037. That's an important day in my life. Because according to deathclock.com, it's the day I'm going to die. I'm not kidding. Deathclock.com, put your date in there and see the day you're going to die. Kind of shake you into reality. If you knew the day you were going to die, and if you really knew, how would you live? Would you go skydiving, Rocky Mountain climbing, 2.7 seconds on a... You guys listen to too much country music. Would you love deeper and speak sweeter, offer forgiveness you've been denying? Or maybe would you party like it's 1999? 1999 wasn't that great, was it? <clears throat> now, if you really knew, if you really knew the day you were going to die, how would you live your life? If you knew that, hey, I've got, I've got uh, uh, you know, uh, 14 years or 12 years or 22 years or, uh, you know, I've got one day, how would you live your life? Some people in our uh, world are faced with that, aren't they? You know, they're not maybe given a day, but they're given a, a time period. Maybe some of your family members, maybe you, maybe there's some folks here uh, I think last service we had some folks here who have been given uh, an amount of time that they're going to live. And uh, doctors say this is all we can do. This is how long we expect you to live. But really when you think about it, we all have that, don't we? I mean, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. The book of James says uh, our life is like a, what, a vapor. Here today and gone tomorrow. And if by the Lord's will we live tomorrow, then we'll do what the Lord wills. We can't make our plans based on tomorrow. Today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. So I'm kind of glad my day's on a Sunday. I hope I'm still preaching. I think I'll plan to preach now through that day. At least if I retire before this, that day I want to be preaching. You know, if I live into the day, maybe if I die in the afternoon, I want to be preaching on that day because I want to go down in mid-sentence, you know? I want to be saying something dramatic, I mean something powerful. I want to, I want to have the finger out, you know. I want to be pointing at somebody and, and just go. Uh, and just, you know, that would be a great way to go, wouldn't it? If you're a preacher, preaching, preaching the gospel, I think that would be a great way uh, just, to, just to go, uh, you know, that day. Well, today we're going to talk about two guys who knew the day they were going to die. They knew uh, because it had been told to them. They were in jail. They were waiting. They were prisoners. They were criminals. And they said, uh, we're, we're told, rather, that uh, you're going to die. You're going to die with this other guy. You're going to die. You're going to die tomorrow. Uh, or maybe it was next week. But the day finally came, and they knew that by the end of the day, they would most likely be dead. They were going to die. And so we get kind of a picture of two guys here who were hanging with the Savior, and they knew they were going to die, and so they had some choices to make along the way, along this journey of, of several hours of their life. And of course, you know the story of the two thieves, these two guys who hung with Jesus. We've, we, we've, we've waited in this series to get up close to Jesus. We've been talking about people around the cross on Good Friday, the passive crowd, the, the religious leaders who were, you know, they were, they, they were afraid their place was going to be stolen. We've looked at the soldiers. We've looked at the, uh, you know, the women who were there caring for him. And, and uh, of course, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea last week. And today, we're, we're just going to get right up close and look at these two guys. And every one of the Gospels has a mention of them. And I want to read every place in the Gospels that mentions these two guys. First, Matthew, uh, you know, they're mentioned here in these verses. Matthew 27, uh, Matthew says, Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Verse 39 says, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads. <clears throat> Verse 44 says, in the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Now, that's important because it doesn't say the bad rebel. It says that both rebels were mocking Jesus and insulting him. Mark, who actually historically predates Matthew, but... We'll read it next because it comes next in the, in the book. 
It says in verse 27, they crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Verse 32 says, those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Luke says two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Now we're going to go back to Luke because it's in Luke's gospel that we get more of the story. But right now we're going to read John. John mentions these guys. Verse 18 simply says, there they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. So let's go back to Luke, and let's see about these two guys, one that was on his right, one that was on his left, these criminals, and let, let's see a little bit more of their story. So this is more of Luke's story. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. And here's, you know, my criminal voice. Hey, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So that's kind of all we know. You know, they're all mentioned in the four gospels, but Luke gives us a little bit more detail of what went on that day as they were hanging there alongside of Jesus. So it's, it's, it's verified in all four Gospels, and Luke tells us, who's the physician, the doctor, gives us a little more detail about this incredible conversation that has since been talked about and, and uh, written about and preached on and even sung about uh, for the last 2,000 years because of this event. You know, if Luke hadn't told us that there was a conversation that went on between these uh, three men uh, we would never know about it. So uh, what an incredible uh, insight or window into the, the scene at the cross that day. Now, I have to tell you, before I get into really what I want to talk about, there's a little bit of a controversy with Jesus' response to the, uh, to, the, to the thief, to the good thief. Church tradition gives him the name Dismas, but it's not mentioned in the text, uh, so we won't go with that. But you might read somewhere Dismas, the good thief. But there's a controversy about this comma. It's called the comma controversy. You see, in, in, uh, in Greek, in the Greek language, and most ancient languages didn't use punctuation marks. It wasn't until the 9th century, the 9th century, when scholars or scribes were hand copying the Bible, that they began to put punctuation marks. And a lot of times they put them according to where they thought they should go. But the original writers didn't use punctuation marks. <clears throat> And besides that, Mark, who we think is the earliest gospel, was writing his gospel probably 20 years at least after Jesus actually spoke the words. So did G what did Jesus say there? And how was it recorded? Well, the, the comma controversy doesn't make a lot of difference, but it makes a little bit if you're interested in what happened to Jesus and what happened to the criminal on that day. So the comma controversy moves that comma where Jesus says, truly I tell you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise, to after today. Truly, I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. The reason this is a little bit of a problem is because on Sunday morning, Jesus told Mary Magdalene, don't cling to me, don't touch me, because I haven't yet ascended to the Father. So he hadn't even been to paradise yet, most believe. How could he tell the guy, today, you're going to be with me in paradise? So it's just a view of the afterlife, a view of what you think about you know, what happens to people when they die. But it doesn't make a lot of difference today. I just wanted to, for some of you who are a little bit more studious, you might <clears throat> read about the comma controversy. Plus, I've never mentioned the comma controversy in my preaching, and I wanted to do that. So let's talk about these guys. Really, wh what was it about them? Who were they? Uh, we don't really know. We don't know where they came from. We just know what they were called and probably the life they lived we know this, they were fulfilling prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53. The prophet was talking about the suffering servant in that, that incredible passage, chapter 53 of Isaiah, which talks about all these things that Jesus went through, mentions this in verse 12. The Jesus, uh, God is talking here through Isaiah and says about Jesus, I will give him a portion among the great 
And he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So even, even dying between these two thieves, Jesus was fulfilling prophecy just by being between these guys. Let's talk about them. I want to tell you three things about them. First of all, these men did something that we cannot do. They did something we cannot do. First of all, they lived in the time of Jesus. That's kind of a duh moment, isn't it? We can't live in the time of Jesus. We can't go back in time and live there. But, but what if we could? What if we could? Knowing what we know now about Jesus, not going back and having the same knowledge that the people of the first century had. I'm, I mean, going back and knowing what we know now about Jesus, ever after having worshipped him in his worship service and knowing all that we do, that he was truly the Messiah, that, that history would hinge on this man. <clears throat> what if we could go back? I imagine most of us would have a hard time living in the first century. It would probably be something like, if you've been to Haiti, maybe the mountains of Haiti where there's there's, it's crude living conditions. There's no electricity, no running water, no uh, modern conveniences at all, no fast uh, 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 transportation, no uh, med express down on the corner uh, to have your health care taken care of, and, and no a lot of the things you and I have today, no uh, cleanliness like you and I have today. Uh, I imagine a lot of us would struggle living in the first century. I mean, it would, it would be rough on a lot of us, you know, uh, uh, some, for some people, uh, they're, they're kind of high maintenance, you know, when it comes to their upkeep. Are you with me? The, the upkeep is, well, it can be expensive and it can be kind of high maintenance. Like, you know, it's call ahead to see if the, if the hotel has a hairdryer kind of deal. You with me? Uh, so if, if we were living in the first century times, it'd be kind of rough on some of us. It, it, it'd be tough. Maybe it'd be like a remote village in... South America or, uh, you know, the deserts of Africa. But what if we could? Let me ask you a question. If you could, knowing what you know now about Jesus, go back and live just a day with him or a, a year or the three years of his ministry, would you? Because of who he is? Uh, someone asked the question, if, if you got to heaven and Jesus wasn't there, would you want to stay? You see, there are a lot of people who like Jesus, who follow Jesus, who call themselves Christians because of what he promises. You know, the streets of gold and all of this. But if he's not there, so what? I just, you know, kind of like my life. And somehow we have to get back to where he is all and in all. He is all and in all. So uh, the, these guys did something that we cannot do. They lived in his time and they heard him speak. And we, we can't hear him speak. Now, I want to say a quick word about a lot of people use the thief on the cross to dismiss, uh, you know, baptism or devalue it. And, you know, they'll ask the question, what about the thief? You know, he wasn't, he wasn't baptized. Well, that presumes that, you know, that, that, uh, that the baptism saves you, which we, we know it doesn't. Jesus saves you. But, therefore, a lot of people will dismiss baptism. It's not water that saves you, Peter said. It's the... Sign of a clear conscience. It's, your, it's what's going on in your life. It's what he, he's doing to you, and, and, in, and it's your obedience. But, but here's what's happened to this, this thief. He's become like the rally cry for people who want to say, forget any kind of obedience in my life. Just forget it. I, there's no, I don't have to do anything. Uh, I can mentally believe in Jesus, then I can go all, along my way and do whatever I want to do. And that's very presumptuous. Because there's a life of obedience that follows accepting Christ. Would you agree with me? I mean, you can't just say, okay, I, I believe, Lord, uh, remember me today. I'm about to die. I'm going to go do this stupid thing here. And if I die, would you kind of protect me there? I'm in a foxhole. I'm getting shot at. Uh, on and on and on and on. And use this as an excuse to say, hey, I don't have to obey. I don't have to do anything. Are you with me? <clears throat> you tracking with me? Because uh, of this thief, uh, many people have become a little bit presumptuous with their, with their obedience and said, 
Huh, he didn't have to do anything, but mentally and verbally, so neither do I. But I want to tell you, obedience was important to the people of the first century. It was, uh, obedience was important to the, to the people in the book of Acts. It was important enough, lots of different obedience, but baptism included to 2,000, 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, to the Philippian jailer that very hour, to the Ethiopian eunuch who stopped the caravan, and we could go on down through there. I would, I would say to you today, don't presume that you will get the same treatment that the thief on the cross got. Now, does that mean Jesus isn't fair? I'm not talking about his fairness. I'm talking about this guy verbally heard Jesus make a promise to him. And if you hear Jesus make a promise to you, number one, record it for us so we'll all know it. And, you know, we're recording everything else today. And uh, number two, then who could, who could ever dispute that? But all we have today remaining is the written word of God. It's the written word. And we are called to live a life of obedience. You with me? So let's not let this thief dismiss a life of obedience uh, to our Savior. These men did something we can't do. They, they were living there with Jesus at that time. He spoke to them, and whatever Jesus spoke was so. We should seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near and not put off that decision. These men did something we cannot do. They also did something we should not do. They were criminals, weren't they? <clears throat> the, the Bible uses a couple Greek words to define them. Uh, one is kakorgos, so that which means a criminal or an evildoer. And then uh, I think Luke uses the word lestes, which is robber or bandit or highwayman. It kind of makes us think of the, of the poor guy who was traveling you know, from Samaria, uh, Samaria uh, and he was attacked by robbers and highwaymen. And left for dead, and then the good Samaritan came and helped him. So these guys were bad guys. Listen, these were the guys who'd beat you up and take your money and leave you for dead. They were the worst of the worst. They, they were the guys who, hey, they didn't care where you came from. They didn't care where you were going. All they cared about was what you had, and they were going to take it from you. And so groups in the first century would travel in, in larger groups. You know, people would travel in larger groups to deter thieves from attacking them. So uh, these were the worst. I mean, they were, the, the words used to describe these guys, there, there are several words used, but these are the two these gospel writers use. And uh, they're the, the, the writers are trying to say these are, the, these are criminals. These are, these are guys who, who will kill you. And who knows how many people they had robbed and killed and stolen from. They were bad guys. They were, they were making the drug deals on the corners and then shooting the, the people if they didn't come through for them. They also mocked Jesus. <clears throat> now, this is important because we sometimes think that only the religious leaders mocked him or only one thief mocked him. But the Bible says, if you remember in Matthew and Mark, that both criminals were mocking Jesus. And this is kind of a cool thing. It's, uh, it's like it shows the, the transforming power of the gospel lived out in front of us over time and how a man's heart can go from being hard and cold and cruel to becoming soft and to responding to Jesus. But they mocked him. Now I want you to think about this. I think when Steve Harley preached in this series a few weeks ago, he described, if you were here, the, uh, the way a, a crucified victim would die. And basically, your weight was in three places. All of the weight of your body would have been on those three nails, one through both feet, a long, maybe 16-inch spike, and one through each of your hands somewhere, so no bones were broken. So all your weight would be on, your, on those nails. <clears throat> so... You know, first of all, you're beaten before you go to the cross, so you're already, you know, half gone, and uh, and so you're hanging up there, and every every minute in that blazing sun of the Middle East is an excruciating minute for you. Every hour is uh, just a, a, another march, uh, mile or two down toward death, and so. This whole process, while these guys are suffering there, they use their energy and their strength and everything they have to mock Jesus. What kind of people are these? 
kind of people knowing that I'm going to die today, and before I die, I'm going to, I'm going to curse you. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you what I think of you. That's a cold heart, isn't it? That's, that's almost evil. But, of course, we know what happens. But initially, they, they mocked Jesus. And I just want to tell you, it, it, by virtue of you being here today, tells me that most of you have a soft heart. But if, if you're there and there's some, there's some armor around your heart or some kind of, uh, uh, you know, that won't, let, well, that won't let our Savior in, if there's some kind of ice around your heart, I want to tell you, time is too short to be bitter at somebody, isn't it? Time is too short to, to, to go to your grave and be angry at someone. You know, there are people who are just angry. They're angry at someone because somebody hurt my feelings or somebody did this or, or they stole this from me or, or, or you know, they took this from my, our parents uh, or our grandparents and, and I'm, I'm going to be angry until the day I die about it. And I want to tell you, life is too short for that, isn't it? It's too short. And uh, we have to learn to forgive and let it go and just and live and live. And all we're really entitled to in life is, is a, a space. We're not even entitled to our breath. Did, did you know that? By virtue of being sinners, we are not even entitled to breath. All we're entitled to is the space we occupy. And after you die, that diminishes in a hurry and turns to bones, which eventually turn to dust. So <clears throat> think about that. Uh, there's things we should not do, and that's become bitter mock. The Greek word is blasphemeo, which means to tear somebody down with your words, just to revile them, to slander them. And the third thing they did was they waited to the end to make a choice for eternity, and this is what I was talking about earlier. A lot of people presume upon God's grace that, you know, God, he will forgive me. I'll do something stupid. I'll go ahead and commit this sin. And it's intentional, willful sin, knowing that on the other end, God's going to say, okay, it's all right. I forgive you now. That's what the apostle Paul was talking about in Romans 6 when he said, shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? You see, this was the stupid argument that the Romans and some people in our day make. They say, let me think a minute. God is a God of grace. He loves to forgive people. So I'm going to let God do what he loves to do. I want to go sin so God can do what he loves to do. Isn't that silly? And we, while we may not reason it that way, that's somehow uh, the way we live it out. You know, that I know God will forgive me in the end. I'm going to go ahead and do this. But these guys waited to the end to make their choice for eternity. There was a rabbi one time who was asked by one of his students, Rabbi, they said, uh, when should we repent? And the rabbi said, you should repent on the last day of your life. And the students said, but teacher, they said, we don't know when we're going to die. We don't know what our last day is going to be. And the rabbi said, good point. You should repent now. Yeah, today is the day of salvation. And uh, <clears throat> these men did something we shouldn't do, but they also did, one of them, what, what we should do. This is where it gets good, doesn't it? This is, where, this is where history hinges right here. This is where you and I figure out that we have a chance, that, that we've got a chance. Because one of them did something we should do. This is the transformative power of the gospel. Paul, the apostle, said, I am not ashamed of it, for it is the power of God that brings salvation. So what did they do? This, this one man, Dismas is what church tradition gives him the name. He, first of all, he defended Jesus. When the, when the other guy pulled himself up and said, save us, save yourself. He said, the other guy said, do you not fear God? He defended Jesus. And so should you. We talked about this last week, going public with your faith. Why are you out there in the, in the, in the public arena, in the marketplace, 
and uh, allowing people to, uh, to criticize Christianity and to criticize our Savior. Why are we out there just kind of silently, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, we better not get involved here. We, we better not say anything. Why don't we go public with our faith? Why don't we stand up and say, hey, I don't care if this costs me money. I don't care if this costs me my job. I, I stand up for Jesus. Yesterday, my Saturday small group and I and some of us went to see the movie, Do You Believe? Do You Believe? Is that the name of it? Do You Believe? Anybody seen that yet? If you're in my small group, you've seen it? You have a hand? Okay. <laughs> We've seen it. And uh, this movie has a lot of these uh, episodes in it. And it's, it's a pretty good movie. Take a box of tissues if you're going to go see it. But it's, uh, it's a good movie. It's a, it's a pretty good movie. He defended Jesus. The second thing he did is he admitted he was a helpless sinner deserving death. That's what he told. He said, look, we're suffering justly. He, he's, he's suffering for stuff he didn't do. He also proclaimed his belief in Jesus when he said he's an innocent man. Can you see the process of coming to Christ here? Over the course of several hours, he was starting to watch this man who wasn't whining and complaining. He wasn't shouting back at the people who were shouting at him. He wasn't, uh, uh, you know, cursing back at the two guys hanging on either side of him. He was dying a noble death. He was dying in a way that, uh, that you and I would hope to die one day. Not bitter, not angry, not saying, I'm innocent, you can't do this to me. But knowing in God's bigger plan, everything's going to be okay. And I want to tell you, when you're given a death sentence, and you have a month or two months or three months or six months to live, you've got to come to that point in your life. Or you will die a bitter person. You've got to come to the point to where you're, you say, God has got this. God is in control. My life and my death are in his hands. They're all in his hands. And so this guy proclaimed his belief, and the last thing he did is he put his faith in Jesus for the future because he uttered those words. <clears throat> he said, remember me. And I think the original Greek text lends itself to believing that he was saying that the whole time. A lot of the versions say, and he was saying, remember me. Hey, don't forget me. You still alive over there? Hey, don't forget me. Hey, you all right? Hey, are you okay? Don't forget me. Don't forget me. And so, God's grace, I believe, was visible that day. I think it awakened spiritually both men. It's my, my opinion. I think both men were awakened. I think what was lost in the Garden of Eden, which was our ability to make a choice about God, I think was awakened that day. And only one said, Lord, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Steve Jobs <clears throat> heard in 2004 that he had pancreatic cancer and that he was going to die soon. And he gave the commencement speech at Stanford University. And here's what he said about the importance of death. He said, remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you're going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There's no reason not to follow your heart. And those, those words were good words, and I would use them today, is that, look, I, I don't know <clears throat> when you're going to die. Someone said about that day, they said three crosses stood on Golgotha's brow. One, a thief died in sin and was lost. On another, a thief died to sin and was saved. And on the third, a, a lamb died for sin and was the son of God. So Jesus told him, he said, today I tell you, you'll be with me in paradise, wherever the comma goes. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, 
It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. If anybody knew this better and earlier, I don't know who it would be than that thief who could do nothing. He could do nothing. So, Sunday, August 16th, 2037. I know some of you have been sitting there on your phone and you already, you already found out your date. I can see everything up here. I know you've been, you've been Googling deathclock.com. My wife and I were coming home from dinner with some friends of ours in Ohio the other night, and he's the one that told me about this date, this, uh, this website. And so I said, oh, I'm going I'm to do that and use it Sunday. And so... She put in her date first, and, uh, or her information. It asks very little information. It asks, you know, your, uh, your height, weight, gets your BMI, uh, and, it, you know, your birthday, and a few other things. And uh, her death date was 2017. I'm like, well, that's just two years away. Uh, is your life insurance paid up? I said, all this important <laughs> stuff, you know. I said, what, how in the world? I said, what, what's, what's going on? How can they say that? And she said, I don't know. There's a question here that says, uh, you know, it, it's, it's like you just choose one of these words. And uh, she said, I, I chose the word optimistic. And there were four words to choose from. There, were, there was sadistic, pessimistic, uh, optimistic, and normal. And uh, she chose optimistic. And uh, her death date is two years from now. So I said, well, put mine in there, but don't put optimistic. Put normal. Just put normal. And this is the date I got. So <clears throat> I went back later, and I, I, I put sadistic. I just, I know some people like this, and uh, they were already dead. I put pessimistic, and they, they were dead. So I, 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 I put optimistic, and I'm like, what's going on here? And, uh, and so I got a new date. I got Thursday, October 17, 2052. I'm going to start being optimistic. <laughs> it's going to be all right. I'm going to be optimistic. Why that did that to my wife, I don't know. But I choose to be optimistic. She can do whatever she wants. Normal is what she chose, and it gave her a better, a better date. But, but here's what I figured out. It just takes a little bit of a choice or an adjustment and you get more years added to your life. If you knew your death date and you knew you could make a little adjustment or a choice, it wouldn't be easy. I mean, uh, by nature, I'm a realist, you know, maybe leaning pessimistic. But I'm going to be optimistic from now on. If you knew you could make a little adjustment, a choice, would you do it? If you knew it would give you another 12 or 15 years, or better yet, it would give you eternity with the Savior. Today, I stand before you and offer you this choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Let's pray. God, thank you today for <clears throat> loving us even though we don't deserve it. Thank you for knowing uh, the times of our days from beginning to end and not revealing them to us. But Lord, you look at our life and you look at how we live in your grace, this grace that you give us to awaken from spiritual death, to become aware of the way of life. And by your Holy Spirit and the preaching of the gospel, the sharing of the word, maybe by somebody at a roadside accident or maybe in a church building or perhaps, Lord, in a hospital bed or nursing home, they hear the gospel and by your Holy Spirit, by your transforming grace, they say, yes, Jesus, remember me. That's what we want, God. And that's what I pray for these who are here today, that today would be the day of salvation in their life. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Last service, a young fifth grader uh, was baptized into Christ. What a great celebration we have. Maybe, maybe today is your day to obey him because you have believed. Stand up with me. Let's sing. If you have a decision, you come as we sing.